So uh, we can start. Our next speaker is Esther Banyan from the University of Minnesota, who will give the second in our short series of talks on Markov numbers. All right. Thank you um, to the organizer for the um, invitation and chance to speak here. And thank you to all of you for coming. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll say I uh, primarily do algebraic combinatorics. So I guess, yeah, I don't come from a number theory background. So maybe my emphasis on things will be a little different. And I really like interactions. So feel free to ask. I guess you have to chat, but feel free to ask questions. Um, so I'm just kind of going to talk about this generalization of Markov numbers. Um, it's sort of cooked up from a bigger project I did relating to cluster algebras. So cluster algebras, the definition can be very big. Um, so I'm going to try to just give the highlights, um, but that's really the generalization probably wouldn't make any sense if I didn't talk about cluster algebras. So that's where we're headed. Okay, and I, this was, yeah, a wonderful timing. So you heard a few of these things from Ryan's talk just before me, which was a great talk, but I, it won't be too repetitive. I guess this, the, maybe the next two slides will be a little repetitive. Okay, so a Markov triple, um, again, is a triple of three positive integers satisfying the following Diophantine equation. Okay. <clears throat> and they were studied um, looking at like approximation, the approximations of real numbers and such, which I won't say anything else about that. But yeah, that was some of the motivation. I'm just treating it like it's an interesting sequence on its own. Um, I think it is. And then a Markov number is a number that's in at least one Markov triple. And do these exist? And Ryan gave it away. Um, there's at least one, right? There's the sequence of all ones. We can we can check very easily that that, that um, satisfies it. So then, okay, we found one. Are there more? And again, um, as we heard in the last talk, but uh, we'll just do it specifically for the Markov numbers. Given a tuple, there's a way to cook up more tuples. So if um, ABC is a Markov triple, such as 111. So is, and I'm just going to replace C with something, but it, right, it didn't matter. The order doesn't matter. I could have replaced B or A. Um, so you can replace it with A squared plus B squared over C. And then you might complain that this doesn't look like it, this might not be an integer, right? I'm dividing by something that's worrying. But if you know that this is a Markov triple, you know that this is also, um, let's get it right, 3AB minus C, which is what Ryan, Ryan had that formulation. But I really like this because you see here that it's positive and you see here that it's an integer. So I always find that very satisfying. Um, and this process is an involution you can check. Let's see. Yeah, so using this, we can, starting with 111, we can produce more solutions. Uh, so here's an, a tree again, like you saw in the last talk, um, starting with one, one, one. And again, since the first one is all ones, it doesn't matter which one you replace. So that's why the first two things have smaller degree, but then every one is three regular. Um, and you can actually show that all Markov triples can be found in this tree. So using VA to jumping, starting with one, one, one. Uh, one way to show this is, um, Given a Markov triple, take your biggest element and use this uh, Vieta jumping, or I think it's called root flipping, and you'll get something smaller. So you can induct on the sum of all the elements of your Markov triple. So that's an easy way to show this. Okay. So we're going to use this tree to motivate a way to label these Markov triples. Um, so I've drawn a second tree below it. This tree has rational numbers and you'll see the forbidden one over zero it has infinity as well so we're going to use sort of well we're going to start by just saying these trees look the same but we'll make it more precise but we'll use this to label the markov numbers give us a way to reference different given markov numbers um, so the right we know the rule on the top that beta jumping is how we go from one triple to the next the rule on the bottom is if you have a over b and c over d they can connect to um, another rational number, which is a plus c over b plus d. So for example, okay, so we, I guess we pick somewhere to start. 
So we're going to start at zero, one, and infinity. And then we get rid of infinity first because it's awkward. Um, so then we link to having zero plus one, that's one, over one plus one, that's two. And you can check we keep doing this. Um, and yeah, we make a few, few choices at the beginning, right? We could have flipped like one or zero instead. We just make some choices. And actually, so all of these, these triples with this rule, um, we can draw them all to make a um, like infinite triangulation of part of the upper half plane. And we could translate it if we really wanted all of it. It's, I've heard this called say like the fairy tessellation. So we have sort of our initial triangle is this one that goes up to infinity. So it has zero, one and infinity as um, vertices. And then the others look like more normal triangles like zero, one and one half. So then we can think about each um, Markov triple corresponding to a certain triangle here. Um, so I suppose this would correspond to just the second one. And then for the individual numbers, one way we can see how to match them up. So for example, M25. So on the bottom, I'll look at the first time I see two over five um, and that's here. And so I see, I go up to that same triple here and I, it might not be clear why I picked this one but we'll make it more clear. So then um, 29 could be our two five. Okay. And so this idea of relating the, so we're relating triples to triangles and individual numbers to arcs. That's, so that's really um, some of the cluster algebra connection. So that Vieta jumping process. So let's remind ourselves one form it could take. So we, we saw there were two different ways you could write this, but the form that's a, a fraction, this basically um, is what cluster algebra mutation looks like. So a cluster algebra, you have these special elements, they're rational functions. They come in sets, kind of just like how we had sets of Markov triples. And you can make, again, exchanges. And the exchanges always look like a binomial over something else. OK, so just if you're squinting, they look really similar. And it actually turns out that if you want to find all the, the procedure for specifically finding the Markov triples corresponds to a cluster algebra from a once punctured torus. So I've done my best to draw a once punctured torus here, as well as a triangulation. Okay, so here's my puncture. I have one arc, the pink one goes around like one way, the green one goes along the other, and then sort of a diagonal like blue arc. And right, I'm bad at drawing and it's sort of hard to visualize. So really I wanna think about this in like the, the universal cover. So two dimensional grid and then a, there's like lifts for all these arcs. So I've conveniently lifted the pink arc to um, a set of arcs, all that have sloped zero. I've lifted the green arc to a set of arcs that all have slope, I guess slope infinity, they're vertical. And then the blue arc gets lifted to um, arcs with slope one. Uh, yeah, so that's right. Um, that's gonna correspond to the initial um, triple both for the rational numbers and the initial um, Markov triple of all ones. Okay, so right, we have initial triangulation. So everything, we have three different sort of things going on right now. And all of them have this initial thing, one, 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 or that initial set of rational numbers, this initial triangulation. And then we, we're going to think about other triples corresponding to other triangulations sort of on top of this initial triangulation. And really, again, looking in the universal cover where it's easier to think about things. And this makes the slope thing more precise. So if you think about any other arc on the torus and we lift it up to the universal cover, it'll just be a straight line. Well, it'll be copies of a straight line and they'll have some slope if you just think about this as a Cartesian grid. So that's really what we're going to, yeah. That's really what we mean about like the, well, we're about to do an example but the, um, like the Markov number associated to five will correspond to the arc with slope two five and then whatever it meant back in the torus. So now we're gonna do a, a real life example. Okay, so again, we, we're going to work on two five. Once my, sorry, my screen's catching up. So maybe everyone can take a, a breather. My internet also sometimes is uh, not great. Okay, great. Yeah, maybe the breather was good. Okay, so we'll calculate um, M25. 
So I've drawn an arc with slope two five here. Um, so this would correspond to some arc that like winds around the torus and it would be part of some, a variety of other triangulations. Um, so, and we're, this is all again, sort of inspired from cluster algebras, but you don't need them to like do this procedure. I think people that did comet torques of words were onto something similar. Um, so from this arc, I'm gonna write down a sequence um, of L's and R's and what those are gonna keep track of is as I travel along this arc and I just pick an orientation, I look at the um, arcs of triangulation I cross. And for every adjacent pair, I'll put down in R if um, the shared vertex of those two arcs is to the right of my like black arc, and then an L if it's on the left. So for example, the first one, so I, I cross that green, then the blue, and those share vertex to the right as I'm traveling this way. So my first entry will be an R, and then I'll get an L, in L, in R, in R, in L. Okay. And then um, we're just gonna throw in an extra, we, we throw in an extra letter to both sides. It doesn't matter what you pick because what we're going to do is cook up some sort of continued fraction where um, it will be sort of invariant what we choose. So I'm just gonna put an R here and an L here, but you could, you could flip them if you want. You could do them both R's, both L's and so on. Okay, so we have the sequence keeping track of sort of the configuration of the triangulation that this um, arc is passing through. From there, I'm gonna write down a continued fraction. So that's just gonna keep track of all the R's I see, then all the L's, all the R's, all the L's. So conveniently here, each one is two, because I see two R's and I see two L's, two R's, two L's. So recall a continued fraction is this sort of recursive thing and looks like this. And I definitely did this ahead of time because I wouldn't want to do this on the spot. Okay, so I get 29 over 12. And you will recognize perhaps that 29 was what we just, we just threw out, it, threw out there earlier that that should be M25. But here's really a better reason to say that this is M25. Okay. Yes, so the numerator will always be this. The denominator you could make up or think that it means but we'll just ignore it. Um, so I'll just, so um, I saw this in work by Rabideau and Schiffler. They use, they actually use this to prove certain conjectures about Markov numbers. Um, when you put the ordering, when you put down this ordering with the rational numbers, people ask questions such as how does the Markov number for P over Q compare to the Markov number for P over Q plus I? And they, um, and they predict it would get bigger for P over Q plus I, like a bigger denominator, it should get bigger. And they use this machinery to prove things like that. It's pretty cool. I'll just mention, so this is a bit repetitive, but this is sort of the angle I came in at. So again, it's necessary for maybe the motivation and hopefully it's interesting. Um, you can also compute these numbers by counting certain perfect matchings of graphs. So this comes from work of musiker Schiffler Williams, who again, this is, from a cluster algebra perspective, and we're sort of just setting all our variables to one. So with this from the same picture, so we have our arc um, and we write down the same RL sequence. We don't fluff it out this time. And so now let's again, so now we're gonna look at the consecutive pairs of in our sequence. And if a consecutive pair is different, it goes R then L or L then R, we'll write down a three um, boxes in a row. And if they're the same, we write down a zigzag. And sort of you make an initial choice and then what you do, you don't actually have options after the initial choice. So for example, we started with RL. So it's sort of like we're looking at three arcs in a row now. And then we'll draw three boxes like this. So I just made a choice to go horizontally. But then for instance, for the two Ls, then I, have, I know I have to do the zigzag going up and then I proceed straight line zigzag. So it turns out that this, um, oh, I should say what a perfect matching is. So here's an example. It's a perfect matching is a subset of the edges so that every vertex is touched exactly once. So what I highlighted is a perfect matching. And it turns out this has 29 perfect matchings. I'll admit um, counting, the continued fractions is faster, but maybe this is prettier. 
Okay, so this is all I wanted to say about, so this is all known stuff about the standard Markov numbers and their connection to cluster algebras. So now for the generalization. So <laughs> there's a lot going on here. Um, so essentially we're gonna replace the cluster algebra with what's called a generalized cluster algebra. So what that kind of means is we're going to replace the surface we had, the once punctured torus, which its universal cover had the nice grid and then it made sense to talk about slopes. We're gonna replace that with a sphere that has one puncture and three orbifold points of order three. What is that? Um, so right, orbifolds are surfaces or they're really quotients of surfaces or probably more generally manifolds under group actions. So when we say we have orbifold points, those are sort of like, we have a group action around the orbifold point. So our orbifold points are order three, which means um, you can wind once around them. You can wind twice, so that's also the same as winding once the other direction. And if you wind three times around them, that's like not winding at all. So it's like a mod, just mod three action with winding numbers. Um, I guess the only thing I really want people to take away here is, so here's what a triangulation of a sphere with one puncture and three overfilled points looks like. So again, we have three arcs. They all sort of have the symmetric relationship. So in that way, it's all like the torus. It's just that we have orbifold points instead of just a normal surface. And perhaps even more simple, the one thing you can take away is it's like we're replacing this replacement rule from Vieta jumping with this replacement rule, something with three terms instead of two. So that's sort of the generalization of um, when we say generalized cluster algebra. So what we can do is just start with one, one, one and run this procedure and see what happens. So let's go for it. So it looks, I don't know, maybe some of you have better senses of numbers and enjoy, maybe you spot some nice sequences here. Actually, let me know if you spot nice sequences here. But yeah, so we're just running this procedure. So for instance, I go from one, one, one to one, one, three now and so on. The numbers of course get bigger, faster than the normal Markov numbers. Um, so this was sort of a weird way to get there, but these actually do satisfy um, an equation as well. It's given here. Um, so it's not, it looks, it's not the Markov Hurwitz equation, but I enjoyed learning about that in the previous talk. This feels like a neighbor maybe. Um, and since this procedure makes this sort of tree structure again, we can still label these by these rational numbers um, using the same, yeah, all the same ideas. So now I'm gonna use n's so that we don't confuse them with the normal Markov numbers. So n25 will be 217. But yeah, but we won't just, again, be artificial about it. We'll see how we can play the similar combinatorial games as before. But now life is a little harder because we're in an orbifold. So I guess we're about to see how life gets harder. Um, <clears throat> so to give you a sense, maybe a little better sense of the surface and what arcs on the surface look like. Um, so here's my triangulation has all the colors and I've drawn another arc gamma. So here's what, a, not, what some arbitrary other arc can look like in this surface. So you see it winds around and in particular, so since the arcs I'm using to triangulate this are, are loops, I'm gonna cross like green two times, then I cross blue two times, then I wind around in pink, and then I repeat what I did on the way back. Okay, and so that's, that's pretty, comp it it's, looks complicated. It was a hard thing to draw. Um, so I'm sort of, what I do is I recycle this picture even though it's a little bit of a lie now because this isn't the cover of what the orbifold looks like but it gets this information down. I cross green, blue, pink, um, green, blue. Wait, I think I did that right. Oh yeah, yeah, that was right. Cause I crossed green an extra time. Okay, so yeah, it gets like the colors down. It's just that now each of these arcs, when I cross an arc here, I really mean I cross two arcs again, cause these are loops. And if I really drew the universal cover of this, it would be, some sort of infinite polygon. It would look fractal, it might look cool, but it would be very hard to work with. So that's why I, I recycle this. But basically we can do all the same stuff. It's just everything is twice as long because it's kind of like every arc is really a loop. So I can form the same LR sequence where sometimes I'm still just keeping track of in here, if the arcs I cross share a vertex to the right or left, 
But I also have to take account for the fact that each of these really, re again, represents two arcs, because you can see here how I have two crossings in a row of green. So to do that, it's not like hard math, but it just gets a bit complicated. You keep track of whether the intersection of your arc with, um, with like your extra arc gamma with your arc in the triangulation is closer to the right or left. Again, so you like write down like y equals mx plus b and find their intersection and look if it's closer to the right or left. So I, I hope it's clear. I think you can see like that first crossing, this dot is closer to the right endpoint of green than the left with respect to this direction. So it's closer to this. So that's why I wrote an, um, I wrote an R here. And then again, we get this R because they share, um, I guess this does look closer to the left here. Let's see if that catches up. So I get an L here and then I get another L for the pair of arcs here and so on. So um, it's definitely doable. Nothing is like using fancy math. It, it does take longer. But anyway, so we, we write these all down and then again, we, can, we fluff these out with an extra R and an extra L for the same reasons as before. So what we'll get is that this generalized Markov number, which we just pointed to it on the tree and said, oh, it's 217. But 217 is also the numerator oops, of the continued fraction given by these numbers. Um, yeah, I guess I'll say you always, your, your, your central intersection is kind of, it's kind of nice. It's always directly in the middle. So the middlemost thing could be an L or R, but it turns out that doesn't matter because the Continued fraction is invariant if you flip the entries. Um, so I guess where I came in, again, this is like less efficient, but just to say like why I did this um, with my colleague, Elizabeth Kelly, we made something called generalized snake graphs. So the graphs we are counting for the standard case are called snake graphs in cluster algebra theory. And we essentially made snake graphs for the orbifold case. Um, so again, that was my window in, but the continued fractions are a lot easier. So for the example before, using this RL sequence, here's the graph you get. Um, it has some symmetries, but it's kind of big, so it might be hard to see them. I also just drew it artificially with hexagons because we, we sometimes use these hexagonal tiles when arcs wind around the orbital point. It wasn't necessary here, but I thought it looked kind of fun with the hexagons. I guess I'll say each hexagon represents crossing like, like both crossings at once. Like we saw it cross things in pairs. So that's one motivation for those. But with my last couple of minutes, I just have one more slide. <clears throat> and this is just about some special subsequences that show up in the Markov numbers and um, highlighting how it follows in these generalized Markov numbers. So the yellow one I've highlighted, so first in the standard Markov numbers, hopefully <laughs> most folks represent these. Um, these are, um, right, every other Fibonacci number, so we see two, five, 13, 34, and so on. You can definitely show that that would always happen. The um, rational numbers those are labeled by are one over N. So that's, that's pretty nice. For instance, I drew what a standard one over N looks like. In particular, you can see the continued fraction you'd get. Well, this, the LR sequence, right, would be L, R, L, R. So you can show, right, continued fractions show up when you, no, sorry. Fibonacci numbers show up when you do the continued fraction for all ones. Um, so here's what shows up for the generalized case. Um, this number was in the OEIS, but I think just because it satisfies like a simpler relation, because essentially you're keeping one number fixed at one the whole time. And then in, again, in the standard case, um, you also get Pell numbers. That's what I've labeled in blue. And I believe that the, the rational numbers that show up are the ones that sort of hug one half the closest possible. Um, the blue in the generalist case did not show up in the OEIS and I don't know. Although if it's like, um, I guess these are again, every other Pell number. So it could be tricky. Maybe it's well known, but there's like missing numbers in between. Um, so if anyone's seen these numbers, let me know or any other fun sequences. But yeah, thank you so much for listening. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh... So are there any questions for Esther? For people who have been uh, around since the morning, it's- It's a long day. A long day, yes. Uh, let me just check. Uh, 
So again, thank you very much. And um, the next talk will be in five minutes. Uh, good. Uh, Gabriella, if you want to. I am here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you want that I share? The... Yes, please. Okay.